Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How is everybody? All right. All right. Good to see everybody. Good to see you, Deandra and Cameron. We see the last time I did a children's message and someone said I scared Cameron off and she'd never come back. <laughs> She's back. That's good. Um, our announcements are in the bulletin. I just want to say um, I bought the stuff and we collected enough money to um, make 48 hygiene kits. So y'all were incredibly generous. So that is wonderful. And a, a UMW project uh, is the penny and a prayer. Kathy, did you want to speak to that? Right, so um, you can read this thing here. You take a container, keep your spare change. The idea is every time you put in a penny, you say a little prayer. Of course, most of the time I throw in other coins as well, so I guess you give 25 prayers every time you put a quarter in there. Anyway, um, but yeah, and they, at the, uh, we're gonna collect them up on uh, July the 14th and then put it in with our mission giving for that year. Also notice the announcement about the canine training. Uh, we were approached, Jan's, uh, Eden's son is a canine officer in Gerta about using the church, not the sanctuary, but the, the fellowship hall and the youth building uh, for canine training. You know, they put drugs somewhere on the property and then they teach the dogs to find it. So. Our first um, event is going to be at 9.45 on Tuesday, June the 11th. So don't be alarmed if you see a lot of deputies' cars out in the parking lot. Nothing has happened. They're just working with the dogs in here. What? It might be fun to watch. I don't know, I don't know if they will allow spectators, but if you want to be a spectator, you can ask Jan to ask her son, and uh, she'll check it out, I guess. And what time is that? They start at 9.45 in the morning, and it'll run, they said a couple hours, I think, give or take, and they're gonna do that once a month. They're gonna train the dogs here, and they, they train them at other places too, but I guess getting a facility where you can train them is a little bit difficult, so. Anyway, um, okay. Any other announcements anybody have that you can think of? Okay, very good then. All right, let me get my stuff together here. All right, if you'll um, turn our hearts and our thoughts towards worship and join me, uh, well, pray with me and I'll pray the opening prayer. God of power and grace, we come before you this morning with praise and thanksgiving. Open our minds to what you have to teach us. Open our hearts to your love and enable us to love you in a new and more profound way. Open our souls to the joy that can only be found in you. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.
doing the call of worship this morning, and uh, if y'all will please stand at the table. As we gather this morning to worship, may we speak truth, so that our words may give grace to those who hear. May we pray in faith, so those so that our, our words may give grace to those who hear. May we sing with joy, so that our words may give grace to those who hear. May we listen with open minds and receptive hearts, so that your words may give grace to us who hear. Please remain standing. We'll be singing worthy to worship out of the celebration hymn 153. chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. If you've gotten anything, oh, this is out of the, the message Bible. If you've gotten anything out of all the following, out of all the following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor agree with each other, love each other, be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. But put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantages. Forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourself the way Jesus Christ thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but he didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to this advantage of the status no matter what. 
Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredible, humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, led a selfish, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death, the worst kind of death that's possible, a crucifixion. Because of the obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything, ever so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even though those long ago dead and buried, will bow and worship before this Jesus Christ and call out and praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. This is for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be God. Thanks be to God. Thank y'all. We are well trained. <laughs> we are. Well, look, it's time for our children's message. Last time, Cameron wasn't really interested in coming up here, so I went to her. So she's our only official child, although we're all, we're all children. You going to come up this time with, with your grandma, or are you going to stay back there? It doesn't matter to me. All right, we're, we're a traveling children's message today, then. <laughs> so, right. School's out, huh? Counting the days till that you're a child after my heart. I loved school. I really did. I liked summer too. Mostly because I wanted to go barefooted every day. Didn't want to have to wear shoes. Anyway, today I'm going to talk about family. And I'm going to talk about this family. We're all like a family in here. And you have your own family at home, right? <coughs> what does she call it? And you got other people in your family, but this is your family too. So I'd like to give you a kiss. There you go. Have a kiss. <laughs> ah. I'm part of the family too. That's exactly <laughs> Yeah, help to do help them do stuff. 
stuff. Do you ever help help your mom do stuff, Cameron? They do. Yeah. We can clean up. We can. You're good. All right. I have to. We have to go take my mother a, a kiss. I should give her kisses every day. Lots of them. Kisses. Love and hugs. That's right. You want to go give those choir folks a kiss? Although they should not eat chocolate before singing because it makes your throat weird. They can save it. I did. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. All right. That's perfect. Good job, Cameron. Thank you. And you can give me a kiss. There we go. We'll save these kisses for another day. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Cameron. So when we think of, yes. We can put our wrappers in the offering plate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't leave your wrappers all over the building. Um, and if anybody wants another kiss, they'll sit right there. If you're feeling really kissable, you can run up and get another kiss. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So we want to think about all the ways we show love to our families today. So let's say a prayer together. God, we thank you so much for our families, the ones that live in our houses with us, the ones that live in other places and the ones gathered here in this church today. We thank you so much, and we thank you for Cameron. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'd like to share our celebrations and our concerns this morning. Um, what have I done with my water bottle? Oh, there it is. Um, Sylvia is sick, so we'll keep her in our prayers. I think it's a cold, or at least Major thinks it's a cold. So whatever it is, she's not feeling very well. So we'll keep her in prayer. Um, we want to especially remember to uh, Tony Collie and, um, of course, Sue and his family. It's always stressful when you've got somebody sick and in the hospital. Uh, anybody heard an update since about Thursday? I think the last update I heard was Thursday. Uh, at that point, he was he was responding some, and uh, but they still had him in ICU. And uh, Tony had a stroke, and so did B.J. Beasley, but B.J. was fortunate enough to get to the hospital in time to have the clot buster treatment, and, and he's coming along pretty well in his home. Um, we're also praying for um, Charles's brother's wife died, and so his brother and Charles's family. We want to pray for traveling mercy. Sydney's coming home from Vietnam this week, I think. And um, Susie and Booty, uh, Joanne and Charles, the folks who aren't here and you know who have some who are having some difficulties in life. Uh, Jan Edgar's son Brian was in the ER last night with kidney stones. How's he doing, Jan? Better? No. Oh. He's home, but he just, he's in so much pain, he can't hardly stand. Oh, man. They'll have to get him out of there, I guess. Um, a, a family that are friends of the Edgars, the Hernandez family, they're still struggling after a miscarriage, and I know we had talked about another family that has um, an early uh, child who only lived a few hours, Lindsay White. And so, you know, there are things like that are really, really stressful. And there are a number of people who, um, who struggle with that. By way of celebration, I'm glad everybody's here. And um, Trey, who is the Edgar's granddaughter, is coming to stay for a couple of weeks. So that's always fun. It was good news that the Israelis res rescued the hostages and of course we always are thankful for D-Day, the remembrance of D-Day and other other things that remind us of our freedom. Um, 
I'm particularly celebrating today my son Robert and his wife Tristan, who both are in the military. Robert's in the Navy, Tristan's in the Marines. They've been stationed in Okinawa for four years. They're come, they've come home, they're gonna be stationed in Northern Virginia, but they're coming down for lunch today. So nice. get to see my little grandchildren. They'll look like different people, no doubt. I've seen them on the computer, so it won't be a total shock. Friday is Iris's birthday. Should be much rejoicing about that. Um, A.B., who was here earlier, his oldest grandson graduated with honors. And we talked in our Sunday school class about, we were so thankful for all the positive um, news from graduations, kids who got scholarships and, and kids with honors and all the successful, if uneventful graduations that have gone on. And we're so, we're so happy for that. And we were talking about blueberries and figs in the back. I, I ride by those cornfields on the shortcut, checking to see how tall they are. I'm waiting for the corn. But we're just, I'm thankful for all the things that are growing and blooming and, and all that kind of stuff. Does anybody else have any praises or concerns you'd like to raise before we go, to pray, go in prayer? To add to the graduation, my little sister graduates from Hickory High School this Friday, and she's going to Regent. So excited for her. Oh, cool, another graduate. Yeah. Good job. Excellent. All right. All the all the graduates of this time of year were so thankful for for those kids. All right. Let us pray. God, we thank you. We come to you and with so much thanksgiving in our hearts for the graduates, for our family members, for birthdays and celebrations and all the good things, the food that's growing on the trees and the bushes. We, Lord, we, we love to look around our creation and see all the things you have made for us. We are truly thankful, Lord. And we also come with concerns. We are concerned about people who are sick. Tony and DJ in particular have had strokes, but there are all kinds of other folks whose names we don't even know, but Lord, you know them. We ask that you bring a healing touch and ease the worries of those families and caregivers. And Lord, we know, we know and understand grief, and we ask that you comfort and be with Charles's brother and the extended family and the loss of, of Charles's brother's wife. And Lord, we know that the loss of a child is just incredibly painful. And Lord, we will ask that you continue to be with the family who have lost ch children, newborns or mis through miscarriage. That's such a painful thing to happen, Lord. And we ask that you bring comfort in those families. Lord, we also ask you to be with those folks in our congregation and others that we may know who are struggling with dementia. The, that is such an, a complicated disease and takes away people that we love. And we ask that you be in those lives, give peace and comfort to all those people who are involved in those situations. Lord, we bring before you the Hernandez family, um, Jan's son, all those people who are suffering. Be with them, ease pain. And we come before you today praying as your son Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
time to share our tithes and our offerings. And uh, I was just reading a little bit more about the health initiative that's supported by the Methodist Church. Um, among other things, it was a really cool story about how the United Methodist Church is involved in um, measles prevention in the Congo and uh, you know with education with vaccinations and you know we don't really have to worry too much about measles in this country anymore i don't know if y'all remember having the measles i certainly was really sick with the measles when i was a kid and i have a friend who's deaf because of the measles so it can be a really devastating disease to children we're thankful for vaccines and we're really thankful for the united methodist church who um, is working all over the globe trying to help people with diseases like the measles. So if I, the ushers will come forward, we'll take up our tithes and our offerings. Seems to be missing an usher. singing the next hymn, I love to tell the story, number 444.
as I gave a preview in the children's message, I want to talk a little bit about God's family. There are two passages in Acts, early in Acts, that talk about the family that was the early church. So I'll read both of them. One comes from Acts 2, 42 to 47. I'm reading from the Common English Bible. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. A sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. The Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. And the second passage is from Acts 4, 32 to 37. The community of believers was, a, was one in heart and mind. None of them would say, this is mine, about any of their possessions, but held everything in common. The apostles continued to bear powerful witness to the resurrection of Lord Jesus, and an abundance of grace was at work among them all. There were no needy persons among them. Those who owned properties or houses would sell them, bring the proceeds from the sales, and place them in the care and under the authority of the apostles. Then it was distributed to anyone who was in need. Joseph, whom one of the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, that is, one who encourages, was a Levite from Cyprus. He owned a field, sold it, brought the money, and placed it in the care and under the authority of the apostles. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. So the earliest church, uh, earliest Christians, they didn't call themselves that at the time. They were called people of the way. They kind of lived as a single family. And when you live as a family under one roof, you know, you don't see this chair or this table or this carton of milk as mine. You see it as ours. It's our table, our car, our house. Um, and so the things they had were shared in common. And you can think, you know, you can think about the way we talk about our stuff in our household. And people, the earners in the household, don't see the money they bring in as theirs, but rather as belonging to the whole household. And that's part of what it means to be a family. If you think about a family business, some of y'all know folks who have family, people who have family business where, you know, the whole family works in the family business. And they pool their resources. They have a common pool of money and the extended family works together. But even in a lot of families, even if people are working in different jobs, they still kind of pool their resources in some way. And the early, this early family of Christ followers was like this. Well now, as they added numbers to their group, that made more challenges because you can only get so many people under one roof, right? And, um, and so next week, I'm gonna talk about some of those challenges and, and kind of what happened there. But they still, even people in different places, managed to uphold the family structure. If you listen to what Major read about the family at Philippi, the church family at Philippi, it says if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort in love, any sharing in the spirit, any sympathy, complete my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, being united. Don't do anything for selfish purposes, but with humility, think of others as better than yourself. Instead of each person watching out for their own good, watch out what's better for others. So this kind of family sense is still true in our congregations today. We were talking, this, we, this is our church family here. And we don't think about, this is my candlestick, right? This is our candlestick. This is our building. Um, and of course, everything we have comes from God, clearly. But you know, we don't, we're not possessive of things in our church, or at least we shouldn't be. Um, and we pool our money, that's what we just did. 
You gave, gave our money into a pool, and then it's used for the purposes to upkeep the church, to pay pastors, to do whatever we do with it. And some of it goes on to the larger family of the United Methodist Church and all the global missions that they have going. So it seems to me at least four characteristics I see in this, these passages, four characteristics of God's family, characteristics of our family. Um, one is that we're deeply united. We are, as the passage says, in one in heart and mind. And this is shown in the common life of the believers. They shared meals. They broke bread, it says, with gladness and simplicity. And they met together to worship God and to learn and to share. I think that eating together is important. Major and I have talked a lot about it when we did that community meal. And we like to have a meal every now and again where we all get a chance to eat together. There's something about sharing a meal together that just makes us remember who, who we are. So we want to do that early, early on when uh, Tony gets here. And we haven't got a solid plan yet, but we'll get there. Usually, Major and I talk about that, and we, we're kind of like the meal train, me and I, and Danielle. So we'll think about that thing, see what we can do early on while Tony is here. Maybe July 14th, we'll think about that, uh, tentatively. But this getting together in gladness and simplicity, I love that expression. That's 246 there. And they met together to worship God and to learn and to share with each other. Um, and I think the passage is not talking about agreeing on every little detail. That's kind of not what it's about. Because if we tossed up a question right now, I guarantee you there'd be so many different opinions in here. That, that's not what we're talking about. But we're talking about being of one heart. We agree on what's really important. We are a community of the New Covenant, just like those early churches were. And in the early church, they, rec they remembered the Old Testament prophecies from Jeremiah and Ezekiel, where God promises Jeremiah there will be people with one heart and one way. And Luke, who wrote Acts, is kind of seeing this played out in Christ followers, people who are supporting each other and living into this unified fellowship. And of course, there were issues. Any group has issues. And we don't have to agree on everything, but we share a common belief in Jesus and the power of redemption. And we are of one heart. And I really think that it saddens Jesus to see divisions in the church family. It certainly saddens me. I really have some hope though, because when, and when something happens, you know, when there's a tragedy or a natural disaster or something, people will pull together. I was, you know, when you, I, this past week when BJ had the stroke and I thought about the number of people across denominations were praying for him. We were all of one heart in this community. So many people, you know, know them. And I think that when it comes right down to it, many, many people are of one heart, even though we attend different churches, we may have different <coughs> divisions. I would love to see a time when everybody just attended one big giant church together, maybe. I don't know. Anyhow, but being, being agreeing on the, on the important stuff, I think that that's the unity this passage is talking about. The other thing is um, what they refer to as the apostles' teaching and prayer. They were then, and we are now, witnesses to God's grace, and we're always trying to demonstrate God's goodness teaching, not necessarily just up here like I'm doing, but we have teaching opportunities every day, all the time. And we have ways of teaching about Jesus's life. Um, and we, I think, demonstrate that. It says an abundance of grace was at work among them. That abundance of grace involves forgiveness, caring, all those things. And we're a community of prayer as well. We live in a relationship with God, praying without ceasing, as Paul says. So those things, listening to the teaching, sharing teaching with each other, discussing the Bible, this, you know, sharing in our lives is a really important characteristic of the family here. 
and the family of God. The third thing I see in here is this extravagant generosity, uh, giving for the good of the whole. Now they talk in here about selling off excess property. They had an issue there in Jerusalem where they had so many people, 3,000, 5,000 people came to be believers in a very short period of time. And some of them were from far off. So they came there, they didn't have much stuff, they didn't have jobs, they were sort of in need. So these early Christians came up with a way to provide for all of the group. Anybody who had excess gave into the coffer and they collected it up in a big, and then distributed it out as, they, um, as, as people needed it. I don't think they sold their houses they were living in because clearly they had places they met, so they didn't sell everything they had but they sold off excess like Barnabas did um, in that passage I read. I think like them, we should look at our priorities and our priorities should be based on celebrating God's generosity by being generous ourselves, both with our money and our time. And what we do with our money and our possessions and our time declares loudly what kind of community we are. It tells people who we are. And if we want people to join us and say, wow, that's a group of people I'd like to hang with, I'd like to be in that family, then we have to be demonstrating that generosity of spirit that we see in here. And I think allowing the Sheriff's Department to come in is an act of generosity. We're sharing our building with other people. You know, there's no need to sit here and locking the place up all week and nobody using it. Um, so we're trying to do, think of ways that we can share our resources. And finally, these were a people of encouragement. They fostered a culture of encouragement. They gave time and friendship and a generosity of spirit to encourage each other. Now Barnabas, he was the son of encouragement is his nickname. He shows up in here, I think, and there are other people who show up in Acts that show what it's like to follow Jesus in practice. First off, he sold off his excess stuff and he shared it with the whole. And here he's joined up with the apostles, sharing and, and being an encourager. He shows up several more times in Acts. He's the guy that when Paul is converted on the road to Damascus, you know, people are pretty skeptical of Paul. He was a bad guy to the early Christians. He was not a nice man. And then when he's converted and says, you know, I've seen Jesus and now I want to preach about Jesus. Some of them were like, yeah, I'm not so sure about this guy. But Barnabas, he's the one that took him and took him to the apostles and told them his story and told them about how Paul had been preaching in Damascus. He was kind of a bridge builder, was Barnabas. Um, in Acts, that happens in Acts 9. And in Acts 11, when the group in Jerusalem heard about how Peter and the others were welcoming Gentiles, they sent Barnabas to Antioch to see what was going on because they weren't really sure about this whole thing. And when he got there, he was so filled with the Holy Spirit and he was so excited to see the word of Jesus being, being preached to the Gentiles that he met up with Paul and he, they all, well, he went over to Tarsus to search for Paul. And when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. So Barnabas, Barnabas was kind of a missionary almost there. It was in Antioch, by the way, that the folks, the disciples were first labeled as Christians. So there are a lot of examples in acts of encouragement and support within the community of believers that we call the early church. And it happens here in our, in our own group. I think that in this little family and the, and the greater Christian family, there are so many examples of encouragement and support. Now we decided that we wanted to be more intentional in our care of our family, this particular family. So the congregational care team met and Iris has nicely made up this little flyer. Some of you got that. If you didn't get one, Kathy's gonna email it out and I have a few more here. But some of the ways that we can care for each other are to drive somebody to the doctor or some other place they have to go, you know, if they have to have surgery or something. Or if someone needs a prescription or groceries picked up, we can also visit people in the hospital, visit somebody in a nursing home. We can sit with somebody to give the caregiver a break. We can take a meal to somebody who needs it. 
And those were things that we wanted to be a little bit more organized and intentional about. So I've got my number on there and Iris's number. The one thing that I know we are going to do immediately is we want to help Sylvia and AB. They carry meals to live every day. And um, on the weekends, she said, lunch is sometimes difficult. So she'd really like to get people to take live a lunch on Saturday and she's not sure about Sunday. But once we get that firmed up, we're gonna to try to step in and help that situation out a little bit. So if you're, if you're willing to occasionally bring a meal over to Liz, give Iris a call or get on the list. And when we get organized, you know, if we have 10 people, you may have to do it once every two months or something like that. But we wanna make plans to help support that situation. Um, we spoke with Lila Warner's caregiver and she would like some respite care. So we may end up doing that. We've um, spoken with a few other folks and so we're ready to try to help and support our, our community. I've included on here our three nursing home residents at the moment. If you want to visit or send a card, this is their address there. You can certainly send a card or it's difficult to call. I'll grant you that. Um, but Jan has been seeing Bob, been to see Bob Gowitska, and I think he has a phone at uh, the rehab place. Laverne doesn't hear well and doesn't really, is not able to take calls. But if you want to go visit Laverne, this is where she is. This is where all these folks are. So, you know, just we just want to kind of remember that we're a family and kind of take care of each other. And that's sort of what the congregational care team has talked about. And we're all on the same team here. We're all in the same family. And so we want to think about these passages and acts in our attempt to be more intentionally God's family. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this church family. We thank you for all the support and love over the years, and we look forward to supporting and loving each other into the future. Be with us, help us to learn, and help us be intentional in our service to you and to each other. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our last song is They'll Know We Are Christians. Here we go, Julie. <laughs> this is one of mine and Julie's favorites. 429.
We're glad we're part of God's family. Be with us now as we join our brothers and our sisters, both in this church and in the community. Help us be loving, forgiving, filled with grace, extravagantly generous, and be your children. Amen and amen. Amen. amen.